Hi there. This will be a short video on the five issues and debates that students need to understand for AS level in the CIE psychology syllabus 9990. Uh, as I said, there are five issues and debates represented by these pictures. There are a further five issues and debates at A level. So I will make a separate video for those issues and debates. However, if you're taking all four papers together, you need to know all 10. These five for AS level and the other five for A level. So I'll get straight into it. The five issues and debates at AS level are applying psychology to everyday life, individual versus situational explanations, nature versus nurture, using children in psychological research and using animals in psychological research. So the first one, applying psychology to everyday life, is exactly what it sounds like. Essentially, we use this issue to evaluate research and write about or think about, is it useful? Can we apply or use this in any way that benefits anyone? And a clear example of useful application of psychological research is the Saavedra and Silverman study in unit four, the learning approach. This study is about treating a boy who has a phobia of buttons. This phobia is causing the boy, was causing the boy and his mother significant distress. And in the results, we can see that six months and 12 months after the study took place, the boy is exhibiting far less symptoms of a phobia. He can wear shirts with buttons on them. He can go to school. He can be in a room with people wearing buttons. So this is an example of psychological research improving someone's life. So a good example of application. Um, you could also speak about Milgram. In the Milgram study, there were many factors that might explain why people obeyed the researcher even when it seemed like they did not want to. Uh, for example, the way he was dressed. He was wearing a lab coat. So we could apply that to schools or to the military or the police and suggest that people in authority should wear a uniform or they should dress formally to ensure that those who are supposed to obey them do so. The second issue, well, this one's a debate, individual and situational explanations. Uh, this boils down to how do we explain people's behavior? We can go with individual explanations. So we explain their behavior based on something within them, personality, biology, whatever it is. Situational explanations explain behavior using environmental factors. So social pressure, for example, in that moment, when they do the behavior, what is around them? What situation are they in? So Milgram again, as an example, it's often a useful example. In Milgram's study, 65% of participants administered the highest shock that they could, which was 450 volts. They believed that they were shocking another participant. However, they clearly were not comfortable doing so. They were trembling, they were sweating, they were biting their lips. Some of them had full-blown seizures, according to Milgram. He called these signs of extreme tension. So why did they do it if they were clearly uncomfortable doing so? Well, according to Milgram, there were a, num num a number of situational factors that may have pressured participants to obey. So Milgram here is using situational explanations. He's not looking at the individual participants and attempting to explain what they did based on that. He's explaining what they did based on the situation they were in. And some of the factors he mentions are the prestigious location. So they were in Yale University. And that may pressure people to obey because they feel they should trust this organization. If the researcher there tells them to do something, there must be a good reason for it, is what they might be thinking. Uh, also, the status of the researcher, he works at Yale, 
and he's dressed in a lab coat, which is a symbol of expertise. And also, the researcher was sitting very close to the participants. So that proximity might pressure them to obey as well. Here's another example of individual and situational explanations. So this man is pulling that lever to change the, change the direction of the tram. It's going to go up here and it's going to hit the guy on the tracks like this. The question is, does this make him a bad person? Or is there a situational factor that might explain his decision? You may have seen this before. This is a situational factor. He's in an impossible situation. So he can pull the lever and the tram will go to the track with one person. Or he can do nothing and the tram will continue onwards towards the five people. Uh, if he had time, of course, he could free them. But in this image and this example, he doesn't have time. So he has to make a decision. So again, that's a situational explanation. If this track was empty and he decided to switch it anyway, you might blame the individual. You may say that he's a bad person for deciding to do that. His personality is malicious. Okay, the third one is probably the most famous debate that we have here on the syllabus, nature versus nurture. Uh, it's a very old debate. It boils down to whether we can explain who we are, what we do, what we think, how we feel, using nature, biological factors like genetics, or nurture, environmental factors throughout our lives, what we've learned throughout our life. Um, the question is, which one has a greater influence on our thoughts, our behavior, and who we are? Some people get a bit mixed up with this and individual situational, and they see situational and nurture as the same. It's not. Situational is about that one moment, explaining a behavior based on the situation at the time that the behavior takes place. Nurture is about learning. Everything you've experienced throughout your whole life contributes to nurture. Not just what you're experience at, experiencing at any one given moment. So if we were to place these five uh, words and phrases somewhere on the nature-nurture continuum, you would likely do something like this. Physical strength, um, I would say both. It's hard to pick which is more important. So I'm going to put it pretty much in the middle. Eye color, if we don't include contacts and things like that, is purely nature. It's biology. Accent, the way you speak, is purely nurture. There's nothing in your genetics or DNA that will decide the way you speak. Uh, you speak similarly to the people you hear throughout your life. So if both of your parents are from Brazil, but you grow up in England, are you going to have a Brazilian or an English accent? Most likely you'll have an English accent. Uh, height, I would say is more nature, but nurture is definitely a factor as well. Like diet, for example, will affect how tall you grow. And musical talent, this one's debatable. Again, a bit of both. I'm going to put it more on the side of nurture, though. Move that one over a bit. And go right there. Do you agree? Do you not? You can leave a comment and let me know. Uh, the only two that are not really debatable here are eye color and accent. Eye color, 100% nature. Again, if you don't include things like contact lenses. Accent is nurture. Unless you want to argue that most people grow up with their parents who have a certain accent, but that is still nurture. It's nothing to do with the actual genetics. It's hearing those people and imitating them, essentially. Okay, so for some things, nature is clearly more important, like I said, eye color. For many things, it's not so clear. 
So I have a bit of a dark example. If a man or a woman abuses their kids, <coughs> sorry, is it because they've learnt that behaviour or because they were born with violent tendencies? It could be both, it could be either. Most behaviours are both and it's not always clear which is more powerful. So, as I said, an interaction between nature and nurture generally explain our behavior. Uh, as I mentioned, even height is influenced by both. Some people tend to think it's all nature. It's not. It's, it's largely nature, but environmental factors like nutrition are also important. Some researchers claiming that environmental factors can account for about 30% in the variance in height. Okay, so two left, using children in research, using animals in research. These are both exactly what they sound like, and they tie in a lot with ethics. So with children, is it moral, is it ethical to ask children to take part? Can they give informed consent? Legally, in most countries, parents must also give consent if a child is involved. Is this enough, though? It's debatable. Um, for example, in 1920, the Little Albert experiment took place. You probably learned about this in class. Uh, this experiment, well, it was a case study, not an experiment, really. It was conducted on a baby boy who was too young to give consent. It may almost certainly did cause emotional harm. And I will talk you through it with a little cartoon by a man called Matteo Farinella. If you like his style, you can go find more of his work on his website, MatteoFarinella.com. So in 1920, the psychologist John B. Watson performed an evil experiment. Evil is a strong word, but it's certainly unethical. He observed that young children have an innate fear of loud noises. They're naturally afraid of loud noises. Uh, this is classical conditioning. He wanted to show that he could condition the baby to be afraid of something they're not normally afraid of. In this case, it was a rat. Um, he chose Albert, who was the nine month old son of a nurse working in the hospital. And they placed Albert in the middle of a room with a white lab rat and Albert was not afraid. He reached for it with no fear. However, then Watson began making loud noises behind Albert's back every time the rat was nearby. Albert showed fear. The noise scared him. Over time, Albert associated the rat with the noise and he became very distressed when he saw the rat. And Watson never really move, removed that conditioning. So that's a large part of why it's so unethical. So the point of this story is that it's it's difficult. When we use children, you have to be very careful because they're especially vulnerable. You have to really think about ethics even more than you would with adults. And the same issues come up with animals. Can they give informed consent? They can't, realistically. Does it matter? Some people will say no. Some will say yes, of course. And one example of a highly unethical Study that was conducted on monkeys in 1969 is this one, in which they were given addictive drugs and taught how to take them. They wanted to see how far they would go. And of course, humans can almost kill themselves, sometimes do kill themselves due to addictive drugs. Uh, I'm not sure if any of these animals died, but they were certainly harmed. As they had their addictive drugs, they knew how to take them. And they became addicted and they wanted more and more and more. So they are the five issues and debates that you need to know about. So again, applying psychology to everyday life is about how useful research is. Individual versus situational explanations is about how we explain behavior. Do we explain it using characteristics of an individual or using the situation they are in? Nature versus nurture is also how we explain behavior and who people are. Is it down to biology or learning, essentially? 
And the last two are largely about ethics and whether it is ethical to use children and whether it is ethical to use animals in research. And that's it. If you want to know about the five issues and debates at A level, keep an eye out. I will make a video on those issues and debates soon. Okay, bye-bye.